All right. You're listening to 91.5 WUML Lowell. The program is Blues Deluxe, and it's my distinct and honor to have a Rock and Roll Hall of Famer with me and a Blues Hall of Famer, both. Mr. Elvin Bishop, how are you, sir? I'm doing good. My pleasure. My pleasure, too, to have you. It's been a while since you and I spoke last. It has. I don't remember when it was exactly, but I know it was a long time ago. Yeah, a long time ago. And you were, you know, you were here not too, a year or two ago up at the White Mountain Boogie. I remember that. Right. And uh, you were doing your, uh, doing the, was the big fun? Or was that wasn't with Charlie? Charlie's recently. Yeah. Big fun trio, my regular yeah. band. Yeah. Yep. All right, let's go back. The way I do these interviews, I go back to the beginning with you guys so our listening audience can get a better understanding of who you are and where you came from. So where are you originally from, Elvin? Uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. So did you grow up there or you moved? Uh, I was born in Glendale, California, because my dad was in the Army in World War II. This is 1942. Wow. Not 1842, 1942. <laughs> and then uh, you know, shortly after, I moved back to his homeland, which is Iowa. And I stayed there till I was about 10. And then we moved to Oklahoma. And uh, so when did you start playing guitar and singing and doing all the things that you do? I started a little tiny bit in uh, Tulsa, but I wasn't... Uh, it wasn't very far advanced. I moved to Chicago when I graduated from high school because I had fallen in love with blues over the radio. And uh, I didn't know much, but I knew that Chicago was where the blues was happening. So, And that was AM radio back then, right? Yeah. AM radio was playing all of that all over. the. You could get it anywhere in the country. Uh, you said... You could get it in Tulsa because uh, Tulsa's on the prairie and it's flat. And the 50,000 watt stations they had would come in after midnight when the local station shut down. So I'd listen to WLAC in Nashville and uh, XCRB in, in uh, Mexico, like that. What were you listening to growing up? What what types of music were you listening to? I started off just uh, like like all the teenagers did in the fifties, uh, getting into rock. Uh, rock was not. I liked Elvis and and um, Chuck Berry and Fast Domino and like that, you know. And then uh, I eventually found out where all the good parts of the rock was coming from, and it was blues. So I went for that. And who was the first person you heard in blues on the radio? Can you remember that? Uh, I remember the first one that really knocked me out. And uh, it was, see, I had this big radio that was, in those days, it was a combination radio and a record player. And it was more like a piece of furniture than what you think of as a radio, you know? Yeah. And, uh, after midnight, you know, I was supposed to be sleeping. I was in junior high school or something. And uh, I'd be listening to that radio kind of softly, you know, and those orange tubes would be glowing. And it was real cool. And they played Jimmy Reed, Honest I Do. And that sharp squealing harp came through the static and everything. I said, oh, man. That's it. That's it. That's the stuff. That's what I want. That's what you want. Yeah. So eventually you went to college in Chicago mm -hmm. and you, from what I, I, you know, the, the documentary on Butterfield, I saw, but I saw much of what you spoke about there. So I'm going to bring some of that up. You went to Chicago, and Paul was in, in, in college with you at the same time, correct? No. No? He just lived in, he lived in the neighborhood. Ah. So you got to see him. He was in the neighborhood, and he was playing guitar at first, correct? There you go. You did your homework. See that? 
Yeah. And how good of a guitar player was he? Was he? Because I never saw any of him playing guitar. Uh, he was adequate guitar player. He play, had a good blues feel, and it uh, it was good for backing up his vocals and everything. You know, he played he played simple stuff, but it was right on. And and, uh, and then he converted ahead. right to harmonica. He got into harmonica, and within six months, he was. He was he was just gone. You could tell he was a natural genius on the instrument. And then the two of you, how did the two of you actually meet? Uh, I was walking around the neighborhood my first day in town to check it, check out, you know, the big city, Chicago, you know, and I was a little bit of a, of a, kind of a, a hick from from Tulsa, you know, <laughs> square as a pool table and twice as green. And I saw this guy sitting there drinking a quart of beer and playing blues on the guitar, and I just kind of gravitated over there, and we got to be friends right quick, you know? Yeah. And then eventually the both of you got to play in some of the clubs on the south side, right? Yeah. We, we started out for just playing acoustic at parties and everything. It was... Uh, this was 1960. It was way before civil rights. And um, integration wasn't even really happening to any large degree, even in big towns like northern towns like Chicago. Uh, but the neighborhood that the university was in, Hyde Park, was kind of an exception. And there was, well, you, you, could, you could hang out with black people safely and, 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 uh, and have a little fun, you know. We played a lot of parties there at that time. And then you got to see some of the big names that were in those playing in those clubs. First first week I was in Chicago, I was down at Pepper's Lounge checking out Muddy Waters. Amazing. So what was that like to be in, in in the midst of Muddy and his band and in, in, in a in a club in south, the south side of Chicago as a kid? Well, Muddy had the greatest band in the world. The first time I saw him, that was James Cotton, Otis Spann, Willie Big Eye Smith, um, Pat Hare, and a bass player. And that's the first blues band I'd ever seen live. I said, damn, these blues bands are pretty good, you know? <laughs> and and uh, I don't know. I, I never was a guy that uh, that uh, I got good common sense. I'll put it that way. I made lots of friends at the university of the black guys that worked in the cafeteria and I'd go down with them and they'd take me around to the different blues places and uh, and it was real cool. The musicians were, even though I wasn't very good, they were way nicer to me than they had to be, you know? Very nice, friendly people. And uh, the, the college I went to, you didn't really have to go to classes as long as you could come in at the end and pass tests. And I was a good test taker. Not <laughs> worth a damn as a student, but a good test taker, you know? So, so what was it like now that you were listening to it on the radio and now you're actually seeing it? It must have been incredible. It was great. Uh, I, I gradually made friends with several of the musicians and ended up going over to their house and I'd just go get lost in the ghetto for weeks at a time, you know, and <laughs> it was a big, a great learning experience to find out what the words of the blues songs that I've been hearing on records, what, what it meant in connection with real life and uh, how, how those guys' life was and what they were talking about. And you ate it all up. You loved it. I did. I did. I did. And you got to play with some of those guys a little bit later. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I played, I got to play with Muddy and Little Walter, Magic Sam. Otis Rush was very nice to me. I'd go over to his house and he'd 
show me stuff and uh, Sammy Lawhorn. I don't know. Yeah, you know who he is. Yeah, I know who he is. And Junior Wells and oh, all kinds of people and a bunch of guys you never heard of that were great musicians. So tell me about Magic Sam. Magic Sam was a beautiful guy. <clears throat> he uh, he was real self sufficient, man. He'd just sit up there and get that that groove going, and all he needed was a bass player and a drummer. And I don't know if he actually needed them, <laughs> but uh, and uh, he's a great singer and just a real cool guy. No, not many people know about him because he wasn't around very long. But he he was yeah magic. Magic Sam. He was a magic guy. Yeah. He used to hang out with uh, Shaky Jake. And they were, they were, uh, there was this guy named Big Bill Hill that had a radio show on WOPA, which is the west side of Chicago. And he, <laughs> yeah, he, he was a killer, man. They do. They did uh, broadcast a lot of live blues shows, you know, and I'd listen to that. Did you ever get and, to the uh, West Side at all? Did you ever get over yeah, there? A little bit, yeah. Who would you see I over played, there? I played there with, uh, with uh, Hound Dog Taylor a few times. And this other guy, uh, saxophone player. Can't think of his name right now. But uh, the West Side, a lot of times, it was a lot poorer than the South Side. And it was rougher. So you had to watch your step, you know. And uh, a lot of times, there wouldn't even be a bandstand in them little clubs. You just play on the floor, you know. It's wow. kind of like juke joint down South or something, you know. And people don't realize, well, some people don't know this, but Hound Dog had six digits. In his yeah, hand. yeah. I don't he, know that he that he made any use of it, but he did. <laughs> and he was the first artist on Alligator Records, too. <clears throat> yeah, I think he uh, he kind of turned Bruce Iglar out, you know. Yeah. As a, well, as the a story boy. story goes. I I interviewed Bruce last year. <clears throat> story goes. I guess Delmark didn't want to put put a record out. And Bruce said, I'm going to do it with Hound Dog on it. Is that what it was? Yeah. So, Paul Butterfield, you guys played together. You're you're one of the original members of the Butterfield Blues Band. Yeah. When you guys got together, you, um, you stole Wolf's bass player and drummer. Uh, or not you, but Paul did. I guess you could say that. Yeah. He he, he paid him more than he was. They um, Wolf was paying him. I guess is what. what well, the, this this is why uh, why there was a lot of high, a high level of musicianship in Chicago is because the financial situation was so rough. Guys were making ten dollars, eleven dollars a night, and if somebody offered you 12 you were gone <laughs> that was it you know and the that and the fact that um, all the clubs stayed open till four o'clock every night and five on saturday that means i don't care if you were muddy waters or wolf or whoever you were you're glad to get some help about two or three in the morning you know yep and guys would go around there was a lot of sitting in and uh, it was like a big employment agency because you get a chance to sit in and if you made a good showing, you're liable to get a gig out of it some kind of way, you know? And that was an incentive for the musicians to learn all the everybody's repertoire that they wanted to sit in with, you know? So when they got in there, they could sound good. That's, you can make a lot of progress that way. So Jerome Arnold and Sam Lay left and came and played with, 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 with you guys for most of the time. And um, it's, by the way, Sam passed away this year, I saw. I didn't realize that. Yes, he did. He was such a great guy. I interviewed him, too, many years ago, and 
he had some stories to tell. That must have been fun. It was. He was a lot of fun to talk to. Yeah. Especially the wolf stories. He had a lot of them. Yeah. Quite a few. Uh, so here's the thing about you guys, the Butterfield Blues Band. You guys played the north side, not the west or the south side. You started out playing the north side, which was all w- mostly white, right? We we played wherever we could get a gig, and that's how it worked out, yeah. And you guys had the one of the first integrated bands playing in the north, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we like, like I said, this is before civil rights, and uh, yep. A lot of times when we go out of town, we'd uh, end up staying in black hotels because uh, they wouldn't allow the band in uh, the a lot of the white hotels. Actually, got caught in a couple of riots in the you know the years they had the riots sixty yeah seven sixty eight yeah. And uh, Sam and Jerome would have to go out and get his sandwiches and stuff because couldn't go on the street. Wow. Yeah, I heard Paul was uh, d- defensive of of that, of anything, of places you guys couldn't go. He he was very upset. He wouldn't play there, basically. That could be. And that was, you know, Frank Sinatra was the same way with his musicians. I don't know if you remember know that, but he was. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, he he fought. Why, why do you think Sammy Davis Jr. became as famous as he did? He was with Frank. Right. Same thing. Same uh-huh. type of thing. So, the Butterfield Blues Band. You you were with them all the way to what sixty nine? I think, if I remember correctly. Somewhere in there. You, you'll remember more correctly than I will, I'm sure. And uh, you went off on your own. And I remember what you said in the uh, the documentary, that you had some music you wanted to play, but it was not meant for the Butterfield Band. It was stuff that you were writing that you wanted to do on your own. And that was part of the impetus for you to leave. Is Am I right or wrong? Well, uh, partly. Uh I wasn't writing too much in those days, but, uh, you know, anytime you're a side man and you've got some ambition and some push, uh, the thing is band, the band, the blues bands had to be somewhat democratic cause it wasn't paying much. So to make, give the guys a sense of satisfaction with the gig, you'd go see muddy waters. And before he came on, there'd be, they do two or three tunes and cotton would get to do one and span would get to do one, you know, and, uh, you know, you get to do two or three songs that are really close to your heart that you enjoy playing, whether you wrote them or not, you know, and, uh, that goes on for a while. And the thought gradually grows on you that, uh, Hey, what if I got to do all tunes that are really close to my heart? And that's where you're, you eventually end up stepping out and doing your own thing. And you called it the Elvin Bishop Group at that time, correct? Yeah. We tried out seven or eight different names, just just sitting around uh, BS, and you know, and uh, never came up with anything that really had a good catch to it. So I said, "What the hell? I'll just call it by my name." Which was a good move. So tell me about Paul Butterfield. What was he like? He was a strong dude. He uh, he knew what he wanted to do, and uh, he, he uh, I don't know. I always thought that his best his best uh, mo was when he just did things with a true blues identity. He played a lot of like twelve bar blues type stuff, you know. And uh, in later years, he started spreading out all over the place, you know, and trying different things. And uh, to me, he was so good at the other stuff that it was kind of a waste. 
He was trying to break. He was he was trying to push the envelope and and break new barriers in in between rock and blues and you name it. Yeah, psychedelic yeah. music. He could he could do them all to a certain extent, but to not to the exceptional degree that he could do blues. Yeah, he was great with the blues. Yeah. He, then, he was great with anything. I don't mean to, I don't mean to say anything negative about his ability because he was a great musician. So then the Elvin Bishop group, you um put them together and you had a single uh, uh traveling shoes 75 that caught some wind. A little bit. But then right after that, a big you got a big hit, number 3 hit fooled around and fell in love mm -hmm. what was that like to get that to do to hear that you you were making way now all of a sudden uh it was a big surprise but uh, it was a good one and that's mickey thomas right singing on that yeah i try i wrote the tune several years before that and i tried to get two or three other people who were good singers to do it and, and nobody liked it much. So it, it happened really by accident. We were doing an album. We were in Florida in Miami doing the album and uh, we had almost enough for the whole album. I said, we need one more thing. You got anything laying around? So um, we went and cut a track for fooled around and it sounded pretty good. And I sang on it. And I said, "This ain't butter in the biscuit, you know, Mick." But <laughs> how would you feel about trying this? He says, "All right," and he killed it. You're not kidding. He killed it. It went to yeah. number three. And uh, that song has been still on the radio. You must be getting royalties from that still. I bet. Yeah. Is that a good thing today in these these times? Well, it's better to have a hit than not to have one. That's for sure. In many respects. Yeah, you know, as a songwriter, I've always been maybe not quite not quite the stereotypical type of songwriter that's going to appeal to mega millions of people. I'm more my heroes have always been guys like uh, like Jimmy McCracklin and uh, Percy Mayfield, you know, something with yep. a little individual quirk to it, you know. But you you write hundreds of them, throw them up against the wall, see what sticks. Next. <laughs> I also looked at your bio, and it says you've recorded with some blues artists over the years. Early in the seventies, when you just before you you had that hit, you you recorded with John Lee and many others. You were on a Bo Diddley record, Clifton Chenier. Clifton Chenier, yeah, I forgot about yeah. him. Yeah, and BB King, you toured with BB King for a little bit. Yes. What was BB that like with BB? B.B. was a wonderful guy. He's really, really a nice person, very generous, a very, uh, you know, for, yeah. for a guy who was so great, he was he was very humble. I remember the first time uh, I played with him at the Fillmore in San Francisco, he invited me to come over to his hotel, and I went. He answers the door. He's in his dressing gown. He's got sheet music spread all over his bed and he's sitting down there working like a dog on scales and stuff and i said this might be some kind of a lesson to me you know to a young rock guy that thinks maybe a little too much of himself you know and uh here's the greatest blues musician in the world and he's just in the habit of constantly trying to improve himself i said that's that's something to that's something to pay attention to. You got a great photo behind you right there, BB. Yeah. That's him. That's him. So 
You signed with many labels over the years. Fillmore was the original, then Epic and Capricorn, and then Alligator. 1988, it says you signed with Alligator. And you put out a bunch of records back then. And the one that I remember was the Little Smokey Smothers record that you did. Yeah. Smokey was my guy. He, he, um, he and I met early on in Chicago and just became real good friends. And I spent a lot of time at his house and he, he really helped me get started. When you were here in the sixties, right? That was during the, when you were here as a kid in the sixties. Yeah. Yeah. And then later on, you put a record out with them together. Yeah. That was fun. We actually put out two or three, uh, Towards the end, he he got uh, diabetes, and they cut off one of his legs, you know, and Ooh. he was having trouble with uh, his medical bills and all that. So we we put together an album real quick to help him with that, and it it did help him. So I felt good about that. So tell me about the period um, when you had the hit. What were you doing right after that? Trying to are you were you trying to put another record out that would have a hit or what what were you doing? What were you thinking at the time? Just going around doing gigs and uh uh, uh the gigs got bigger and, and the money got better and everything and pretty busy just doing that, you know. Well, let's talk about Raising Hell, my favorite live album that you've put out. That was a really good album. Yeah, uh, the, the live one, right? Yeah, the live one, raising, raising hell. Uh, I had a good band at the time. It was uh, it almost ran me in the poorhouse, but I had like <laughs> horns and uh, background singers and everything. Yeah, you sounded like you were having fun throughout the whole record. Yeah, it was a ball. And then, you know, every few years, I mean, everything that you do has blues steeped in it, no matter what it is, even if it's if, if it's a pop rock song, you, you hear the blues and all the, the blues vein is always there in your music. Yeah, that's the basic thing. Uh, people ask me, well, do you like this hip hop and rap and everything? I said, the more it sounds like blues, the better I like it. <laughs> You you must have heard Chris Thomas King doing some of that. He does some of that. Have you heard that? No. Yeah, it's pretty good. Some of the stuff he's done in the past when he was a kid, he had rap and hip hop ble- <clears throat> with, mixed with funk and blues together. Uh huh. And it's it's pretty good. It was interesting to hear that. Listen to that. Well, he took a, he took a lot of abuse for it, Bo, though I can tell you. Yeah, I guess so. It, you know something? To me, black music is pretty much the same underneath. It's just like trends in clothing or, or, or dance crazes or something like that. That's the surface aspects of it change, but what's, what's really happening underneath, there's a steady current there. Oh, yeah. In 98, you won the Oklahoma Jazz Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Jazz Hall of Fame. Not blues. Well, I think it's called the Jazz and Blues or something. So I think I came under the, the blues part of it. It came under the blues part of it. That's good. And then you became a Rock and Roll Hall of Famer, 2015. Oh, that was a total accident. You know, did you did you think it was going to ever happen? No, I never even considered it. Uh, we got in there, and uh, I said, "I bet you that the Butterfield Blues Band has sold fewer records than anybody in this sucker." <laughs> 
But yeah, they made it. And because of, you know, the band, you you guys, all of you guys in the band. It uh the the general public wasn't quite ready for it. Although what happened was I think the big beautiful blues music was more than overdue to meet up with the white majority, which hadn't happened to any extent. And uh they came together in the Butterfield band and it it worked pretty good. It's tremendously uh, influential with musicians. I don't know how many guys have told me this is what got me into music is listening to you guys, you know. So you um, were inducted in 2015 and then you were inducted into the Blues Hall of Fame, too. Yeah, that was that was really cool. How do you like that? Both both genres of music you've been very involved with. You 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 be, you get you get an you get awards. That's great. Not many people could say they do. Yeah, I'm a lucky guy. And you know it too. That's good. Some people don't. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about the Big Fun Trio. That's the your current group or band yeah uh i've been playing with uh bands with you know seven eight people you know for years and i'm the type of guy you know i understand i want everybody to be happy and you have to be somewhat democratic uh, as a band leader you know and showcase everybody and let them shine somewhat you know and at some point or other, I just realized I'm standing, standing here with my thumb up my what you call it, and listening to a lot of trombone solos and piano solos. And I said, I, I think I need to do something where I can get be more permanently involved, you know. And uh, it's a little scary at first because uh, you you can't take a break in a trio. Anybody drops out, it's immediately big, ob big hole. It's obvious, you know. Yeah. But it, uh, you know, it's one of those things. If you can survive it, it'll make you strong. So, yeah, it was it was pretty cool. The only person I haven't asked you about, I I'm I'm jogging my memory, is Mike Bloomfield, who was the other guitar player in the Butterfly right. band. What yeah, was, he was what was he like? Oh, uh, well, Eric Clapton called him music on two legs, which I thought that's, that's pretty good little quote there, but, uh, he'd been playing, uh, in bands and stuff like that since he was a young teenager. Uh, he knew he was familiar with all kinds of music. His chops were great. He was, he was, had all that covered. Everything from folk music to jazz, he knew a little bit about. And he wasn't even scared of going into Ornette Coleman or Robbie Shankar or something like that, you know, just giving it a shot, you know. Yeah. And uh, he was he was just real intense, you know. He, he'd get in, he'd, you'd be talking to him, he'd be face to face, and he kept getting closer and closer to you, he's spitting all over you, you know, just... He, he, he would just go, you man. He had a very active mind. And he uh, he was on some of Dylan's records. And then I guess they asked him if he wanted to stay on and, and tour. And he said, no, he wanted to stay with you guys. I didn't know that. Yeah. That leads me to Dylan at Newport. You guys, you were, were you there with the band? Yes, I was. But I didn't see... Uh, bloomers play with uh with dylan it uh and i didn't see the big fight between albert grossman and uh and uh, the folk guy you know but uh it turns out i was at the other end of the fairgrounds splitting a half pint with <laughs> mass lipscomb and uh mississippi john hurt you know uh i just Probably better off. You were probably better off. 
<laughs> a blues guy, right straight, you know. Yeah. But uh, I, I I was in the studio when he was cutting, uh, when him and Sam Lay were playing on uh, uh, Maggie's Farm or whatever it was, you know, yep. that album. Yeah. It was an interesting experiment. I mean, experience. Yeah. It, uh, <laughs> It, it worked out. I mean, it, it's amazing. Dylan put all that together in his head, you know. He said, okay, it's time for Brock and this stuff to meet, you know. Yeah. And, and he picked uh, some of the best guys. I mean, blues yeah. influence guys. Yeah. And uh, boy, did it piss off the folk people, though. Yeah, it I know. Folk people. It's still pissing them off today when you think about it. So your latest record, you did it with another gentleman that you knew way back in the day in the 60s, Mr. Charlie Musselwhite. Yeah, Muscle. Uh, we didn't know each other that well in Chicago. Our paths crossed somewhat. The, the main thing we had in common was Big Joe Williams. He uh, he hung out with Big Joe quite a bit, and I did too, sort of. In... It, it was amazing how big the Chicago blues scene was. You could, like, Muscle and I were there for quite a few years at the same time, and hardly ever our paths crossed because he had, there. I bet you there were 200 blues clubs in Chicago at one time. <laughs> it was it was like the, that may be an exaggeration, but not much. Um, it was the living music of the black people in those days. It's like rap is now, or hip hop. I mean, it it dominated. And uh, everybody to get their own circuit of clubs, you know, and Muscle went to his clubs. He said, you ever been to so-and-so club? No. He used to hang out there, you know? Yeah. So what made you decide to put a record out with him now, last year? you st I, It came out in September, October of last year. What made you guys decide you wanted to do this? Uh, on my, on my uh, one of my trio records before that, I had wrote this tune for me and Charlie called 100 Years of Blues. And I went in the studio. We went in the studio and it just was like falling off a log, you know, we just, you know, we're coming from the same place. We knew exactly what to do. And it was meant to got, be, right? Got got to talking, yeah, and said, man, we ought to, we ought to do a, an album, and we did. The other thing I saw, I didn't realize, is your, the song Fool Around and Fell in Love was in a movie. It's Just been in about 25 movies. Right. Car Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 1. You yeah. were in that. It was in that. And and many others, too. That's right, from what I remember. Yeah. So you get, you get royalties for that, too. That's good. Yeah. Do you get involved in any of that stuff when they, when they request it to use the songs? I got a lawyer, you know, that <laughs> kind of does that stuff. So you don't have to worry about that. Uh, try not to, yeah. He takes care of it for you. Well, I get to make the decisions, you know, but uh, yeah. they got to do so the legal stuff. I was looking at your touring schedule, and very interestingly, you're going to be with Buddy Guy soon in the next few weeks, a week or so. Yeah. Are you going to be, be you going to be together or or are you separate? Doing something? separate as far as I know. Although I wouldn't be surprised if we ended up jamming a little bit. And he's another guy from Chicago. You got to hang with him back then, probably. He was a kid back then too with Junior Wells. He, uh, I think the first time I ever saw him was maybe 1961. Yeah, 
Yeah, he's he was great. He's always been great. He's yeah, still, he's still going. That's great. Yeah. One of the oldest, look. one of the oldest guys in Chicago, Jimmy Johnson, just passed a year or two ago. He was something else too. Not that to, long. Yeah, a year ago, something like that. Yeah. I get to talk to him too. He was a fascinating guy to talk to. Yeah, I bet you. In his nine, he died what ninety two, ninety three. Was in his nineties. He had a great little. Uh... You know, one of these Facebook streaming deals, you know? Yeah. He did it from his house, and his wife would sit there and read fan letters from around the world, and he'd sing mother-in-law blues or something, you know, and and uh, talk a little bit. He, he, it was when COVID was happening, he said, he said, I don't go out too much. I'm chicken. <laughs> So you 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 touring with the Big Fun Trio. You're touring with Charlie. You got dates with Charlie. You, you're you're busy with some dates with Buddy Guy. Man, you you're a busy guy. I got a recording session coming up too a little later in the month. Now tell me about that a little bit, if you can. I don't I don't know what it's going to be like. It's a uh, Van Morrison called me up and wanted me to play on a. Uh, he's going to do a blues record. And he wants you to, he's done blues records, but he wants to do a real blues record with you. That's good. Something like that. Tell me about your guitar, the guitars you play. Your favorite that you like to play. Gibson 345. What year? 1959. Vintage 1959. Yeah. And that's hollow body, right? That's a hollow body guitar. Yes, it is. And is that the only one you play, or are there other other guitars that you play? Uh, I got a Telecaster I use once in a while, but not too much. <clears throat> no, I, I tried tried to get Gibson to build me one like the '59, and uh, they came fairly close on a couple of them, but uh, finally I. They had to come clean. They said, well, when we moved the factory from Michigan to Tennessee, we left a lot of the parts there. So we're just, uh, you know, doing the best we can on some some parts of the new guitars. So the latest thing you got going is you're going to be working with Van. Any? How about another record of your own with Alligator? Well... I'll tell you something. When uh, it became apparent that the COVID thing was going to last a while, I said, oh, this is great. A couple of years. I said, I'll, I'll write a ton of tunes, you know? Yeah. Never wrote a damn one. <laughs> Just blank. Kind of uh, stopped me cold. Wow. So you, you've got the impetus to write, though, now, I bet. Yeah, the impetus is there, but the tunes ain't yet. They will eventually. I hope so. So what's Charlie like? What's Charlie like to work with, Charlie Musselwhite? No problem. He's a he's a pretty easygoing guy, as long as, uh, you know, he gets his respect and everything. And... Uh, Musically, it's real good. We, we we started off with a great M.O. He lets me do what I want to, and I let him do what he wants to. There you go. And uh, we just try and back each other up the best we can. I'm going to ask you a question about some of the legends that you've either worked with, opened for. Tell me one memorable story, if you can remember one. Uh, good question, isn't it? Me and me and Smokey, little Smokey Smothers and Pine Top Perkins were in Clarksdale, Mississippi, uh, playing at uh, Ground Zero, 
we had a gig and we had a day off so we went fishing <laughs> and we went to some place south of clarksdale out in the country close to the mississippi river we drove down there and uh guy that would was driving the car said that's the crossroads that robert johnson was talking about i said oh that's cool then we went over started made a turn we're starting to go go across the levees you know to the to the river and there's a white wooden white building there i said what is that he said that's the church muddy waters used to go to I said, wow <laughs> so we went and it's real cool real cool uh fishing camp there you know all the the buildings were up on stilts you know because when it flooded in the spring you know that kept them cool and we're sitting there we're under a tree and fishing and uh smoky messed up and threw his bobber up in the tree and it got stuck <laughs> the pine top said ain't no fish up there <laughs> that's a good story that's it so how do people find out about you you have a website uh social media yeah uh it's called elvinbishopmusic.com i used to just have elvinbishop.com but while i wasn't paying attention you know some uh scammers but but that uh but that title up yeah and tried to extort me for 25 grand wow and i said oh the hell with you because <laughs> so it pissed them off every time you would type in elvinbishop.com you get a site called bone my wife <laughs> <laughs> that's when i changed it to elvin bishop music <laughs> wow that's crazy. Well, Elvin, I want to thank you very much for taking some time out of your busy day and uh, look forward to seeing you when you come, come to Massachusetts again. That'll be great. I'll be looking for you. Yeah, you you um, need to come to the station maybe if we can get you to the, come down to the station and uh, come and play a little bit in, in the station. Why not? Why not? Well, thanks again. I really appreciate it. And I thank my uh, friends at Alligator for getting this all set up. Yeah, no problem. My pleasure. And we'll do it again. Sounds good. All right. Thanks again. Have a good day. You too. See ya. All right. You're listening to 91.5 WUML Lowell. That was Elvin Bishop right there.